trade, and the challenges of the post-COVID-19 economy. Held with support from the U.S. Embassy Jakarta and in partnership with the Center for Strategic and International Studies Indonesia. My name is Crystal Pryor and I'm Director of Nonproliferation, Technology, and Fellowships at the Pacific Forum. Please note that this session features simultaneous interpretation. You may access the English or Bahasa channels using the globe on the bottom right portion of your screen. To kick off this series, this first session held in partnership with the UPN veteran Jakarta will focus on current trends in regional trade. Southeast Asia has recently experienced a number of consequential economic changes. After signing the ASEAN-led Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, Indonesia, and indeed the rest of Southeast Asia, gained opportunities for stronger bilateral and regional trade engagement with the United States under the revitalized version of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, now known as the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. It's important for Indonesia, as Southeast Asia's most populous country, to, to develop regulatory structures and economic roadmaps to face the changing global and regional landscape, especially once we finally reach a post-COVID-19 economy. Thus, this session will explore trends in regional trade, free trade agreements, and regulations through the prism of international relations. Please note that remarks made in today's program are on the record and the video audio recording of this session will be made available on the Pacific Forum website and social media in the future. This event is also being live streamed on CSIS's YouTube channel. As a reminder to all of our speakers today, please do speak slowly and clearly for the interpreters. I'd now like to introduce my colleague, David Santoro, Vice President of Pacific Forum, to give some brief welcome remarks on behalf of Pacific Forum. David? Thank you very much, Crystal. Um, I'll be very quick. I, I really want to say that we, Pacific Forum, are absolutely delighted to host this session and this series with CSIS Indonesia. More than ever, we are determined to deepen our partnership, both at the, at, the, at the think tank level, but frankly, also at the country level between the United States and Indonesia. The um, US-Indonesia relationship has evolved a lot, especially in recent year, and we believe that there is potential for the two countries to do a lot more together. As I'm sure you all know, the United States and Indonesia entered into a comprehensive partnership in 2010, uh, a partnership that um, initiated consistent high-level engagement on various issues spanning from uh, democracy and civil society, education, security, resilience, and mitigation. The relationship then was further upgraded in 2015 with the signing of the US-Indonesia Strategic Partnership. That partnership expanded the cooperation into various issues uh, that have a very significant regional and global impact. So now we are here in 2021, early in the decade, our countries really, our two countries that really are at a crossroads. They are confronting a highly volatile political, economic, and security environment. And, and they are doing so in the midst, in the midst of an uh, international and ext extremely challenging health crisis. And so in that context, Pacific Forum is proud to launch the virtual series titled Adapting to COVID-19, Indonesia, the United States, and the Indo-Pacific, which is supported by the US Embassy in Jakarta. So as was mentioned, Pacific Forum will collaborate with CSIS Indonesia throughout this series, with which we have had a long-standing uh, partnership. So this is a nine-part virtual series. Uh, which will address broad cross-cutting issues that impact both countries, emerging security issues, COVID-19, of course, regional and bilateral trade and investment, as well as democracy and civil society. 
It will feature American and Indonesian experts with diverse yet complementary backgrounds to examine the trajectory of US-Indonesia relations in the new normal. And so again, welcome everyone. I uh, very much look forward to uh, a, great, a great session and, and a great series. And let me now turn it back uh, to Crystal again. Thank you, David. Next, we'll have welcome remarks from Dr. Shafia Muhibat, head of Department of International Relations at CSIS Indonesia. Dr. Muhibat. Thank you so much, um, Crystal. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me very uh, clearly. Um, so uh, I'd like to start by saying a very good morning. Um, good morning, Indonesia time, of course, to everyone who joins us today. Uh, and also showing my appreciation for the co-organizers for, uh, for today's event, um, Pacific Forum. Um, David, it's good to see you again. And then of course also the, um, the US Embassy in Jakarta, so Mr. Leo Jill, um, it's, it's um, an, an honor to co-organize this event uh, with all of you today. Uh, and also of course um, for today's event, um, also colleagues in uh, Universitas Pembangunan Nasional Veteran um, Jakarta. Uh, it, I'm happy to uh, that this is the first uh, of our series uh, of um, virtual discussion. Um, as mentioned by, by David also, um, we're starting a, a session, uh, a, a virtual uh, discussion series on adapting to COVID-19. So um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone's um, already, you know, um, been used to this various discussions about, about COVID-19, uh, responses to it, adapt, adapting to it. Uh, but I think it's always good that we, we you know, we, we discuss um, new ideas uh, and, and new endeavors uh, in coping with, with the pandemic. And I think um, efforts for economic recovery I think is, is, a, is one very important part of, of coping with uh, with COVID-19 and I think this is something that uh, Indonesia for example has been um, struggling with and um, along with a number of, of other countries um, so I think today's discussion um, uh, will focus on on one part of, of efforts uh, for economic recovery um, post pandemic I suppose uh, talking about you know um, regional trade um, as a way to to help all the regional countries uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in their efforts for, for economic recovery. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, there, there are a lot of um, um, efforts has already been done between Indonesia, the US, and also with, uh, with a number of other countries um, has, has been uh, mentioned, for example, uh, uh, in the region. So um, I think um, this also still leaves a lot of um, um, windows of opportunities for other types of, uh, of collaboration, be it bilateral or, or regional uh, in this issue. And I think uh, with, a, with a crisis as serious as now uh, caused by the pandemic, um, it's important that we uh, will look into each of uh, all of these um, alternatives, ways to recover from, from the economic crisis. Uh, and I think discussions uh, like this one that we are going to have today um, will be very um, essential uh, in allowing uh, rooms for new ideas uh, and, and, and efforts. Um, so with that, um, I, I won't um, take much of your time, but I look forward to not only to today's discussion, but also the rest of the virtual uh, discussion series that CSIS was, will co-host with together with the Pacific Forum. And hopefully this would be, you know, somewhat useful to, to the ongoing discussion uh, on the uh, post-pandemic recovery. Thank you so much, Crystal, and back to you. Thank you so much for that. And um, we really look forward to working with you throughout this whole series. Uh, so now we were supposed to have welcome remarks from Dr. R. Dudi Haryadi, Associate Professor in International Relations and Dean Faculty of Social and Political Science at UPN Jakarta, uh, Veteran Jakarta, but I think he'll be represented by uh, Pak Andi Kuryan, sorry, Kuryawan, uh, because he's not able to, to attend at this moment. Andy? Thank you, Dr. Kristal. Uh, good morning, everyone. Selamat pagi semuanya. Hope you uh, in a very good hold and welcome to the um, our joint webinar with uh, Pacific Forums. Uh, first of all, let me greet uh, Dr. David Santoro, Vice President for Pacific Forum. Thank you very much for your kind uh, attention for us to, uh, to organize this uh, collaboration uh, seminar. Dr. Shafiat Muhibat, uh, Head of Department of International Relations, CSIS. I think uh, CSIS has been uh, very long engaged with international relations issues. And I wish to have uh, much more cooperation with CSIS Jakarta. Mr. Leo Jig, uh, Cultural Affairs of US Embassy Jakarta. Thank you very much, Mr. Leo Jilts, for your um, 
for your productive and uh, considerable uh, cooperation with uh, with uh, our university. Uh, distinguished guests, um, very good morning for you uh, and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, beautiful and uh, productive seminar. On behalf of UPN Jakarta, uh, please allow us to uh, thank for everyone who have uh, participated and uh, supported this this uh, uh, this seminar, this webinar, and we learned that uh, Southeast Asia and United States have been engaged in various corporations, and uh, we understand that uh, uh, trade and investment uh, uh, are. Uh, 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 serious and uh, very strong uh, variables in our regional economy uh, and we understand that U.S., United States and developed common economies have uh, built a, a significant foreign direct investment uh, in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia. And, and now COVID-19 uh, challenge everyone to, uh, to, to see the, how to adapt with the economic challenges in the future. But on the other side, COVID-19 also opens up uh, uh, a much wider opportunity for us to cooperate and co collaborate since we, we learned that um, nobody con could uh, settle or could overcome this issue by him or herself. So I think uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, has, uh, has provided us with a greater opportunity to cooperate, to collaborate with, uh, to, to solve this, this issue. And for your also consideration, uh, UPN Jakarta has an uh, international relations study program that uh, focuses on three uh, field of studies, three subfield of studies, international political economics and international security studies and also global development. I think three uh, subfield, the, these three subfields uh, uh, have been um, uh, main attention for us as a uh, global and international relations school schoolers. Uh, uh, furthermore, we also expect to have uh, joint research exchanges or maybe um, uh, uh, simple as like that. We have to uh, we, we expect to have uh, uh, collaborations in doing uh, joint discussion or joint seminar in the future, in the near future. Uh, and and we we also learned that uh, the choices between economy and health. Uh, in, 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 the, in the context of COVID-19 uh, challenges all the, the decision, decision makers, not only us in emerging markets like us, but also other developed economies. That's why uh, we need to, uh, to help each other to provide how the sufficient and uh, ample uh, solution and problem solving to, to maintain or, let's, or at least to to keep the, the 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 international trade on the tracks, uh, because we we are uh, we are afraid that uh, if we uh, do do not cooperate each others, the the international become uh, getting slower. It will affect all the economies, not only emerging markets. Uh, not limited to that, uh, factions issues are also uh, become uh, uh, considerable uh, issues that needs to be. Uh, uh, analyze and to discuss to give uh, uh, much more uh, uh, much more confidence for economic uh, players to give uh, investment and also conduct uh, uh, international trade uh, uh, either export or import in the future again thank you very much for this opportunity on behalf of our university and on behalf of our dean dr dudi haryadi uh, uh, we have. Uh, we we hope that in the future we could uh, mm, we could have much more cooperation with Pacific Forum, U.S. Embassy, and CSIS. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much for that, Pakandi. Um, finally, we'll have welcome remarks from Mr. Leo Jok, Assistant Cultural Affairs Officer at the U.S. Embassy, Jakarta. Leo. Thank you, Crystal, and good morning, everyone uh, in Indonesia. Um, Good afternoon, good evening to others uh, in the US and other places in the world. Um, as Crystal and David mentioned, and as you all already know, Indonesia has uh, signed and implemented free trade agreements with countries around the world, uh, among others, the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement with the Southeast Asia region and with the greater Asian region, 
the soon to be ratified regional comprehensive economic partnership. Um, what this means is the lowering of tariffs for certain goods, commodities and resources exchanged between partner countries and also hopefully a higher degree of mobility and autonomy for skilled and low skilled labor. With the recent change in our presidential administration, the US presidential administration, uh, President Biden signals an intention to reinvigorate economic engagement with the Pacific region uh, not limited to, but of course, including Indonesia. And this is another option that, of course, um, young Indonesians and the generation um, of Indonesian leaders who will construct future uh, economic policies um, should consider. But the post COVID economy in Indonesia presents also a number of challenges. Uh, how, for example, will labor-based industries like manufacturing and agriculture be resuscitated? And can Indonesian digital economy and tech industries, which have benefited um, during a boom in the pandemic market and landscape, be scaled up to provide national level employment? Um, and what commodities are valuable for Indonesia to sell to trade partners uh, to its competitive advantage, and maybe most importantly, how to construct and develop economic plans and policy structures that align with existing trade agreements and future free trade agreements, how to maximize uh, these opportunities. So we're very excited uh, to discuss with all of you these topics at this morning's session. Uh, the speakers will uh, provide their views and we want to thank again uh, CSIS and Pacific Forum International for their partnership uh, on this event and also of course Department of International Relations Faculty of Social and Political Science, uh, Sciences at Universitas Pombangunan Nacional Veteran Jakarta and most importantly thanks to all of you in the audience for attending please um, don't be shy, ask uh, questions, and enjoy the event. Thank you. Thanks so much, Leo. Again, for those of you who joined late, my name is Crystal Pryor, and I will be moderating today's discussion, which will include plenty of feedback and Q&A with the audience. Participants will be allowed to unmute their mics and ask questions or give feedback, but participants' cameras are disabled throughout the session. We'll also have interactive features like polling as we go along. Here is today's poll. What do you think is the biggest obstacle in the US and Indonesia upgrading their bilateral economic partnership? Is it lack of a central coordinating or harmonizing mechanism? Lack of transparency and accountability measures? Inadequate political will or overlapping regional trade agreements. And as you answer those questions, I will note that we will also have a survey we would like you to complete after the event concludes. We'll share the link to the survey now, so feel free to begin filling it out as the program proceeds. And we'll remind you about this at, again at the end. All right, let me go ahead and share the results. We still have some more votes trickling in, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna end the poll now. Share the results. So pretty even divide actually among perhaps all of these are, are, are obstacles uh, between lack of a central coordinating or harmonizing mechanism, lack of transparency and accountability measures, inadequate political will and overlapping regional trade agreements. So hopefully we'll touch on all of those topics today and think about some ways we might address these obstacles in the relationship. Okay. Uh, so now, finally, to the substance of today's se session, we'll do the three presentations together, followed by Q&A and discussion. This is a friendly reminder for speakers, uh, first of all, to be in the channel you're speaking in for the interpreters, uh, so whether that's English or Bahasa, but also to keep your presentations to 10 minutes so we can have ample time for questions and discussion. This entire session runs for 90 minutes please do remember to speak slowly and clearly for the interpreters and you may access uh, for the audience as well. You may access the live interpretation features 
using the globe at the bottom right portion of your screen. And for participants, you can feel free to raise your hand or submit questions in the Q&A box as you have them during the presentations. You don't have to wait until the very end to start asking questions. So ask them before you forget. Uh, today's presenters for exploring regional trade and the challenges of post-COVID-19 economy are Dr. Bradley J. Merg, Associate Professor of Political Science and Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Administrative Sciences at Paragon International University, Mr. Rocky Intan, researcher at the Department of Politics and International Relations at CSIS Indonesia, and Dr. Shanti Dharmastuti, Senior Lecturer in International Relations at UPN Veteran Jakarta. First up, Dr. Bradley Merg is Associate Professor of Political Science and Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Administrative Sciences at Paragon International University in Cambodia. Additionally, he holds positions as Senior Academic Advisor at Future Forum, Distinguished Fellow and Senior Advisor for Research at the Cambodia Institute for Cooperation and Peace, and Lead Editor of the Journal of Greater Mekong Studies. His work focuses on contemporary international relations in Southeast Asia, the politics of foreign aid, and the political economy of the greater Mekong subregion as a whole. Dr. Merg regularly writes about Southeast Asian affairs in The Diplomat, Asia Times, Nikkei, and South China Morning Post. Dr. Merg, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Pryor, and good morning to all from Phnom Penh, uh, and good, morning, or good evening or good afternoon to uh, viewers in other parts of the world. Uh, this is a great event, and thanks very much uh, to Pacific Forum and to all of the co-organizers for bringing us together uh, to discuss this very wide-ranging topic. Uh, five years ago, if we talked about the future of international trade, we'd be having a very different discussion uh, in the context of the last four years, the U.S. trade war, along with uh, the obvious effects of the global pandemic. Um, today, I'd like to uh, try to narrow a little bit and, and focus my comments on the emerging framework of multilateral uh, trade agreements and try to get a better picture as to where those are going, particularly looking at um, RCEP, looking at the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, and how that's playing out. And then looking at that to some degree through the lens of the role of China uh, and the future options and the future role of the United States in the region as this develops uh, over time. Obviously, as well, we do have the question of recovery from COVID. Uh, and a key element of that really is um, ASEAN as a bloc, is, is the question of South-South cooperation and increasing integration in the region. Um, yet at the same time, we recognize that ASEAN has challenges. Um, here in uh, mainland Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, uh, we begin to see a, a greater and greater divide uh, between the mainland states and the maritime states on various issues. We also continue to see something of a development gap uh, between some of the newer members of ASEAN, such as uh, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, uh, and other states, uh, and some distinct challenges. At the same time, when we look at ASEAN's future role, uh, we see the need for significant reform and capacity building in ASEAN and the, and the very strong need for clear leadership uh, over the course of the next few years, um, such that ASEAN is able to act effectively in negotiation with other larger states. When we look at RCEP itself and the discussion that we've seen so far as to how this goes um, and the earlier American withdrawal from TPP, I think the most uh, thought-provoking, or at least uh, one of the most provocative comments, uh, was the idea that Southeast Asia and East Asia are now today leading the way on global trade, uh, a bright spot in a world of relatively increased protectionism. Um, at the same time, however, uh, there's also the concern that there will be a East Asian or Southeast Asian decoupling from the global economy with a much deeper focus on regional integration between within Southeast Asia and within Southeast and East Asia, um, where uh, the European Union, the United States, uh, to some degree, uh, risk uh, being left out. This is a significant challenge that the Biden administration will have to address. Uh, and fortunately, uh, we do recall that uh, now President Biden stated in 2019 uh, that he was very much in favor of uh, the U.S. returning to, again, then referring to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, uh, now the CPTPP, 
uh, which uh, in my view will, it will be absolutely essential uh, for, uh, for the American economic role in the region to continue and to expand. But let's take a look. Let's take a look at how the degrees of regional supply chains. And we do see uh, the fact that, yes, it, there will clearly be gains in the next 10 years once this is ratified and implemented. Uh, the broadly accepted figure is an expectation of around $200 billion in addition to world income by 2030, a figure of around $500 billion increase in world trade by 2030. So RCEP is, is nothing uh, to, to ignore. It's nothing to just cast to one side. Uh, at the same time, it's not a game changer for multilateral trade or trade in the region. Um, it's a much weaker agreement than we saw from TPP. It doesn't bring in key questions such as uh, protection of labor rights, the role of state-owned enterprises, uh, and especially questions of environmental standards, as we've seen over the course of discussions of what a post-COVID economy will look like in Southeast Asia. Um, many folks, the Asian Development Bank has taken a strong lead uh, talking about uh, recovery and making sure that is a green recovery, that we are adapting uh, in this recovery to the challenges of climate change, et cetera. At the same time, when we look at RCEP and we look at simply the last few years in the context of the US-China trade conflict, um, ASEAN has received, the member states have received varying benefits. These have been quite different. Um, Vietnam has probably been the biggest winner of the global trade war. Uh, and is likely to be a significant beneficiary of RCEP. Um, again, countries such as Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, less so. Um, but RCEP also, while providing some benefits, also yields some potential challenges uh, for the region as it moves forward. Um, due to the way it was structured, the initial winners are very much likely to be China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and on agriculture, uh, New Zealand. Uh, there's a significant concern that what we'll see is a very large flow of exports from China um, with relatively limited exports from the ASEAN states uh, in coming years. This challenge is exacerbated by the fact that RCEP does not include India. Uh, India's decision to withdraw or to, to not participate and not move forward uh, causes uh, the fact, uh, a simple reality that RCEP, the majority of its GDP is China, giving China outside weight in this entity. Uh, that will possibly create challenges. This is something of a test for China as to how it will act globally, uh, whether it will be a responsible global player or whether it will use its sheer economic size uh, to pressure uh, smaller states to bend to its will uh, and to, uh, to, to adhere to the policies that it would prefer. In the context of China, one of the most interesting things that we've seen in the overall regional political economy and in IR in general is that Beijing has used RCEP uh, very strongly to indicate, well, it's not a revisionist power. It has presented itself saying we are a status quo power. We are the preserver of the global status quo, um, although there's ample evidence uh, to the contrary to that contention. But this is something that, that China said, hey, we are actually the ones who, who want to maintain and develop and build this system of multilateral trade. Uh, it's definitely been a significant gain for China uh, as the Trump administration had moved off the stage to some point. At the same time, uh, we see RCEP very strongly buttressing two key elements of Chinese economic policy. Uh, one has been the Made in 2025 manufacturing initiative, um, where we're likely to see and we're beginning to see uh, the fact that, yes, China is moving up the global value chain and it's moving into uh, more high value added industries, but it's also maintaining many of those lower value added uh, uh, industries through automation. Uh, this creates some challenges. We're not, we're not seeing the same level of, of, of movement of lower cost production uh, to lower income economies that we saw in earlier periods because of automation. At the same time, this uh, element, RCEP, also very strongly supports uh, China's uh, 14th five-year plan. China's come out with something new called the dual circulation strategy, um, focusing very much on its domestic market um, in response to the trade war. Uh, and RCEP is something that says, well, we're still focusing on the domestic market, but we're still globally engaged. 
uh, and here's where uh, we show it through this through this through this new agreement as to how things will uh, will eventually move forward. Um, but the biggest concern, really, again, is the possibility of a of more of an East Asia Southeast Asian bloc. Well, that's positive for certain elements of economic integration, absent Indian and or American participation, uh, it does very much put uh, China in a much, much stronger position in terms of how it's able to uh, control that block in terms of the influence that it wields, uh, really yielding uh, a, a strong need for others to move forward. So where do we, where do we shift forward from here? Where do we go? Um, if the US decides to move back in, and hopefully it will, I think a lot of the expectation is not this year as there's significant domestic issues to take care of in the United States, along with continuing COVID crisis, but the possibility for next year, US re-entering CPTPP, uh, that this uh, will be a, a strong benefit, but US influence will be more moderate than it has been in the past, simply reflecting uh, the changes in scale in economies in ASEAN and China, as well as in South Korea and Japan. I think one key lesson we've learned over the last four years and where trade policy uh, goes is that the United States has been quite successful in building up the Quad, the minilateral grouping uh, that includes India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. But other actors uh, such as Indonesia have been somewhat left out uh, and have, have not really been engaged with at the level that, that they would prefer. Uh, and, and thus that's going to be a significant challenge for the Biden administration to move forward. Uh, at the same time, uh, just to sort of finish off, because I see I only have about one minute left, um, one thing I hope we can get to in the discussion is, is ASEAN's role as, as a block, is avoiding these new trade agreements really devolving uh, simply into a way for China to uh, better strengthen its own individual free trade agreements. There's, there's clear means for that to occur, and how ASEAN can best operate effectively, and to better explore uh, the question of what is the future of ASEAN's leadership? Um, what is the future of ASEAN as an institution, um, not just at the trade level, but in the broader area of economic integration? Here in mainland Southeast Asia, we are a very significant uh, part, part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and one of the phrases we use often around here in Phnom Penh and with our colleagues in Vietnam is all roads lead to Kunming. Uh, we are very much shifting to a, a north-south, let's, 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 uh, let's integrate with China model, um, where we're seeing less focus, uh, although there is significant support from Japan and the United States and other actors for east-west trade, for further integration of mainland Southeast Asia. Um, this presents a challenge to, uh, to, to our subregion, uh, but it also presents a, a challenge to ASEAN and the maintenance uh, of ASEAN unity as things move forward. Uh, I see it's now, I, I've, I've, had, I've had my 10 minutes and I know we're all supposed to adhere to time. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop my comments there uh, and uh, yield back to our chair, Dr. Pryor. Thanks so much for that really informative presentation. You covered a lot of ground in 10 minutes. Uh, so let's see, next we have Mr. Rocky Intan. He is a researcher from the Department of Politics and International Relations at CSIS Indonesia. He has participated in various research product projects, including on maritime security in East Asia, China's Belt and Road Initiative in Indonesia, management of disputes in the South China Sea, development cooperation in South-South and triangular cooperation, and Indonesia's possible accession to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mr. Rocky Intan, if you would. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Fryer. Thank you as well for the Pacific Forum and UPN Fatuan Jakarta to hosting this event. Um, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, and Compre Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, very mouthful. Both are visions for strategic engagement in Asia Pacific. And there's a reason here why I call it Asia Pacific, not the more fashionable term Indo-Pacific, as hopefully you all see. So um, today's presentation is, um, this is the outline of this presentation. I will talk about the overview of a trade picture in the region. And for both RCEP and CPTPP, I will first discuss their features, their benefits, and the way forward for both agreements. 
So first of all, it first needs to be said in support of the economic recovery, um, FTAs, free trade agreements such as RCEP and CPTPP, they do not provide direct tools to uh, support the recovery. They are simply platforms to enable them to liberalization, to the reduction of uncertainty, rulemaking, and formation of trade coalition. And on all of these regards, CPTPP and RCEP achieve them. First, uh, on tariff liberalization, they achieve wider than CPTPP compared to RCEP. And the most significant achievement for RCEP is the harmonization of rules of origin. And third, um, these trade agreements also achieve further liberalization in new areas. This is uh, most prominent, for example, in CPTPP, such as in labor rights, protection of the environment, etc. And fourth, CPTPP and RCEP provide platforms for avenue of cooperation for future purposes, as they both have a secretariat for RCEP and they both they, and CPTPP has a commission. So this is the trade. This was the trade picture in around 2015. 2015. As we see, uh, we still have India and RCEP in negotiation, and we also still have the US in TPP, which are not yet named CPTPP. But this is the trade picture we have in this year. We no longer have India, we no longer have the US in TPP, which is now called CPTPP. And as we all see, we have always have countries in the region who are both members of CPTPP and RCEP. And as you might recall, the center of economic gravity within this trade regime is in Asia. Even in, the, even in the Pacific, the biggest economy in the Pacific, the US, is out of CPTPP. And when it comes to the Indian Ocean, the biggest economy, the, the other big economy in the Indian Ocean, in India, is out of RCEP. This makes the term in the Pacific, as, as I said, weak economically as of, as of right now. So what are the features of CPTPP and RCEP? First, the first feature of RCEP is the centrality of ASEAN within it. If we recall, RCEP is simply an amalgamation of various FTAs agreements of ASEAN plus FTAs. ASEAN has an FTA with China. It has an FTA with Korea, with Japan, and Australia, and New Zealand, and India. And it seeks to combine all of them into RCEP. Unfortunately, as we know, India is not one of them, but this does show uh, the importance of the centrality of ASEAN within RCEP. For example, RCEP is the first FTA between uh, China, Korea, and Japan. This, I think, proves the convening power of ASEAN. Second, another important uh, feature of uh, RCEP is the harmonization of rules of origin. I think we can uh, forget, for, forget for a minute the technical details in the left side of the, of the slide, but focus more on the right side of, of this graph. For example, in, in, in any FTA, if we want to qualify for lower tariffs and no quota, uh, we need to have what is called the rules of origin. We need to specify that the goods produced in this, in this trade is actually produced within this member of FTA. And surprisingly, RCEP mem RCEP is the, is a pretty liberal um, rules of origin within its uh, chapters. It, it specifies only 40% of goods when RCEP has to produce within RCEP members to qualify for zero tariffs and no quota within RCEP. This is surprisingly liberal, especially compared to other new trade agreements. For example, in North Korea, uh, in, in North America, in the recently negotiated US MCA. Um, for cars, we need to have 75% of uh, rules of origin to be produced within North America to qualify for zero tariffs. And why does this matter? Um, less restrictive rules of origin means more enhanced regional value chains and larger trade gains for member states. This is another achievement for RCEP. What about, RC what about CPTPP? CPTPP has been hailed as a 21st century trade agreement, just like its predecessor uh, TPP, and it contained detailed and stringent provisions on intellectual property rights, labor rights, government procurement, SOEs, environmental protection, and controversially ISDS. But with the departure of the US, it's a sweet bitter pill because there are certain provisions who are controversial but are now suspended. These have been specified in Annex 2 of CPTPP, and this contain around 24 provisions, including the scope of ISDS and the length of, for example, intellectual property rights. 
But still, even with the suspensions, this still makes CPTPP as an important and one of, one of the most up-to-date uh, trade agreements covering new areas which have not been covered by other trade agreements. Now, what about the benefits of these two, two trade agreements? Quantitatively, we can see that um, even without CPT, even without the US and with, even without India within uh, inside them, CPTPP and RCEP still provides uh, real income increases projections by 2030. And I'm pretty sure that um, as more member states joined uh, in CPTPP and RCEP, these projections will increase, especially with the entrance, re entrance of the US and India, hopefully in the future. And Qualitatively, beyond the numbers, we, could also, we should also remember that FTAs provide platforms for countries to cooperate. And secondly, it provides impetus for member states to reform their economies. So we should take note of these numbers, but we should remember that they don't tell the whole story. Third, so what are the ways forward for RCEP and CPTPP? Uh, RCEP has been negotiated, it has been signed, but it has not been uh, entered into force. It will enter into force 60 days after ratification by six ASEAN member states and three non-ASEAN member states. And um, Indonesia has a pretty clear, clear, straightforward ratification, and it is predicted by the government that it should be uh, taking, it should be effective around 2020, uh, 2022. I mean. What about a potential exception? As we said, the big elephant in the room in RCEP is India, and it is now out of RCEP. And there are certain hopes by RCEP members to renegotiate um, the agreement to, uh, for, for hopes for India to coming in. But um, knowing that India reserved its application because of domestic concerns, um, it's hard to see those concerns changing in the near future. But uh, as well, there are other ways for ASEAN to cooperate and engage in the other in other matters. And secondly, potential members of RCEP um, can also come from potential as a member states. Um, we have heard in the past, for example, Papua New Guinea and Timor Leste and in, um, expressing their interest to join ASEAN. If they join ASEAN, they can also join uh, various ASEAN trade agreements, including RCEP. And in the future, as I said, RCEP has a secretariat now. It will renew, it will meet uh, annually to discuss matters, and it is very um, suggested that RCEP should also renegotiate periodically to add more, uh, to add more halves to its substance in its chapters and provisions. There are various areas in, in the chapters which can be uh, expanded upon, for example, intellectual property rights and services trade, for example. What about CPTPP? CPTPP has taken a head start. It has been effective since December 30, 2018. And uh, there, are, there, is a list, there is a long list of potential accession uh, of member states into CPTPP. Um, prominently, um, member states in RCEP um, have, also have also expressed interest to in joining um, CPTPP, even the US and Indonesia, the US, which is the only member country who have exited uh, CPTPP. Uh, as of right now, the only member state, uh, the only country that has formally applied is the UK. I want to highlight uh, these two cases because uh, for the purposes of today's discussion, there are basically four options for the US to come back to CPTPP. First, option one is to simply accede to the original uh, TPP. It can simply say to the members of CPTPP, okay, I'll be back, but please accept and please um, re, um, re resuspend the um, sus provisions within CPTPP. Option two is to accede to CPTPP um, as is right now with the suspension still going on. Option three is to renegotiate CPTPP. And option four, to pursue sectoral agreements if it can't do that. The most likely option right now is option three for CPTPP. A country as big as the US, with so much trade weight as the US, would, not, would, would like to shape the agreement within um, it is a member of. And with the Democratic Congress, um, it is likely that uh, this will happen down the line, even though not officially, because the U.S. understandably is focused on the recovery. And we can see that um, more labor and environmental protections added to the CPTPP will probably uh, satisfy the U.S. Congress under democratic leadership. But if this doesn't, if this is not feasible still, um, the administration by Joe Biden can still um, engage in Asia Pacific uh, to tackle agreements, for example, in digital trade and services. 
this matters for Indonesia, for example, because um, the reason Indonesia lost interest uh, in joining TPP was the loss of the U.S. within TPP. So if Indonesia does want to come back uh, to TPP, uh, to CPTPP, which is a big if still, Indonesia uh, can only do that on two options, option two or three, by exiting the CPTPP as a whole, or option three to negotiate into CPTPP. Preferably, Indonesia can also do this with other countries within ASEAN so that they can have a collective weight uh, to negotiate within CPTPP. So to conclude my remarks, uh, both, both CPTPP and RCEP are contrasting visions of economic integration, and but both act as complements of substitutes as we can see that there are member countries who are members of both CPTPP and RCEP. And secondly, both RCEP and CPTPP have a scope to expand and further their, deepen their engagement with the member states in the future. And third, uh, Indonesia and the US should also expand their engagement with one another, preferably through these frameworks in CPTPP or other sectoral deals. With that, uh, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that um, really detailed presentation. That was great. Uh, so last but not least, we have Dr. Shanti Dharmastuti, who is a senior lecturer in international relations at UPN Veteran Jakarta, and also engaged in the political economy of international trade. Dr. Dharmastuti, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kristal, for the time. I will uh, try to compress my presentation in 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, in this session, I will discuss about the regional trade in Southeast Asia prospect and challenges. But before we discuss about the regional trade in Southeast Asia, we will see the global trade in the time of COVID-19. We can see that the uh, under COVID-19, when uh, every country uh, had the policy to uh, stop the uh, spread of the COVID-19 with the policy in economics and health. Uh, as we can see in the policy like uh, limitation of the social mobilization and then travel limitation. So uh, that policy uh, give the many consequences in the economic condition. So on the threat side, we can see that COVID-19 has affected supply and demand in the global economy and growth in trade in goods and services declined in 2020 as the effect of the pandemic. From the picture, we can see that global merchandise trade uh, has been seeking in 2020, but it's different from the medical product related to COVID-19 caused these products uh, such as personal protective equipment, ventilators, thermometers, sanitizers, and the like experience very high growth in 2020 because we know that every country need this uh, medical product related to COVID-19 to stop the spread of the virus. And then uh, not only in the good uh, threat in goods, but in threat, uh, threat in services also uh, has been seen in 2020. We can see from the picture. And as I said before, that global merchandise trade in medical product in 2020 uh, increased uh, in 2020 from the January until, until now, but it's different from the non-medical uh, non -medical related to uh, COVID-19-19. It's not uh, the increases uh, uh, not uh, bigger than the medical product related to COVID-19. And then uh, when we're talking about the regional trade in Southeast Asia, it's very interesting because we know that uh, member states uh, has many policy to respond to COVID-19, uh, that they are taking a number of steps or responding to COVID-19, both in the form of export restriction and relaxation of imports. Uh, it is commonly used on uh, the export restriction for the country to keep or maintain the domestic supply. So they uh, implement the implemented on uh, the export restriction, especially in the uh, foodstuff. Uh, but uh, I think the export restriction policy, I think it's good for the short term policy, but in the long term, it's not good, but it can be uh, make the negative impact from the economic condition in the next. So relaxation of import is uh, better cost because I did not know that uh, 
ASEAN countries uh, rely on the international trade too to, uh, to maintain and keep the domestic supply in the country. We can see that trade-related measures issued by ASEAN member states and ASEAN dialogue partners during COVID-19 uh, can be divided to, to points that liberalizing and restrictive. We can see that Indonesia is the uh, one of the countries in ASEAN that has policy that more liberalizing than others. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it is uh, the policy to maintain the international trade to flow the trade and investment in Indonesia. Uh, talking about the ASEAN policies in responding to COVID-19, uh, I try to highlight four points in here. Uh, the first is strengthening regional cooperation. Strengthening regional cooperation is very important for ASEAN, not only in trade, but also investment and other economic cooperation. As we know that uh, since the COVID-19 beginning, that uh, as, uh, ASEAN uh, start the dialogue uh, continuously to uh, prevent this, uh, to solve this issue, and not only in health sector, but also in economic sector. Strengthening the cooperation with external partners is the, of course, it's very important because we know that uh, ASEAN also has many uh, agreement with the external partners in the formation of the comprehensive economic partnership and then economic partnership agreement, free trade agreement. Also, the each member state also uh, has many agreement with the external partners with Japan, South Korea, US, and China. So I think the strengthening cooperation with external partners is very important. But uh, in here, in here, but uh, it's very important for the member states of ASEAN to uh, to more the deeper dialogue with the external partners, because we know that uh, before COVID-19, too, we know that there is a uh, FTA that can running optimally for the ASEAN member states. As uh, I can give the example, especially uh, in Indonesia. Indonesia just now uh, reviewed the Indonesia-Japan economic partnership agreement, but because we know that that uh, agreement uh, doesn't running optimally, especially on uh, capacity building. So I think the strategic cooperation with external partners is very important to make the economic condition look better. And then the third, uh, strengthening the role of the private sector. When the private sector is very important cause uh, private sector is the main actor in the business network in the region. So I think the dialogue between the private sector, the involvement of private sector in the agreement, the implementation agreement is very, very important. Because uh, in the case of Indonesia, uh, sometimes private sector feel that they they did an involvement in the uh, implementation of the agreement or the uh, formation of the agreement. So when the implementation of the agreement, sometimes they face the difficulties and uh, didn't give, uh, have the beneficial match for that agreement. So I think the role of the private sector on the every agreement, every uh, FTA that ASEAN already done is very important in here. And then accelerate the and run the ASEAN SME recovery facility is very important in here because we know that SMEs is one of the economic backbone for ASEAN countries. So I think the cooperation to co financing, financing the SMEs and then upgrading the SMEs and then the uh, market facilitation for the SMEs is very important for the region to make the economic condition better in uh, post COVID in the post COVID-19. So I think the uh, cooperation and collaboration between ASEAN countries and external uh, partners is very important to, uh, important to address the, uh, the how the SMS recovery facility is very important to running the business well in the region. This is prospect and challenges. Prospect and challenges in the uh, about the uh, economic recovery in the future. Uh, we hope that the, uh, in the future that uh, the cooperation and collaboration in the region can facilitate regional value chain to support economic recovery. There is a transparent, coordinated low tariff that facilitates short-term recovery. And then so SEP facilitated regional value chain. Uh, talking about SEP, we know that uh, when talking about SEP, so, uh, everyone will will thinking that I will think that uh, maybe uh, 
uh, three uh, plus three economy will more beneficial than others. Because we know that uh, uh, plus three economy uh, richers uh, richers uh, the value added uh, industrial industrial production than the ASEAN countries. So maybe uh, everyone will think that uh, China and then South Korea and Japan will very very get the beneficial than the other. So I think uh, the review and monitoring of the implementation RCEP in the next is very important. The second is uh, government must give more attention to health policies. Uh, it's very, it is very important because we know that until now that uh, Indonesia is one of the highest cases in the uh, COVID-19 followed by Philippines and Malaysia. So I think government must uh, do the, uh, uh, the do, uh, good policy for the uh, addressing the issue of COVID-19, maximizing the testing, tracing, and treatment. Because uh, when the government can uh, handle the COVID-19 good, so I, I think the confidence of the investor and entrepreneurs to start business in the region will be good. So I think uh, uh, both in health sector and economic sector must be together uh, and the government must uh, keep the pay attention into this two sector but because because uh, economic recovery is very important and depend on the government how to take on the issue of COVID-19 okay thank you Dr. Krista thank you so much um, for that excellent presentation and, and really for three excellent presentations we covered a lot of ground I think with lots of thoughts about our respective futures for the U.S. Indonesia and the region when it comes to trade, especially when we ever do get to that post COVID-19 environment. So I'm already seeing um, several questions or comments from the audience. We do have about just 30 minutes left for questions and discussion. So you have two options for asking questions or you're free to make comments as well. One is to raise your hand in the webinar controls, which I believe is at the bottom of your screen. The, format changed a bit in Zoom, but I, you should see a hand. And uh, the other is to open the Q&A window. You can, to ask a question, you can type your question into the Q&A box and click send. You can also upvote someone else's question if you want it asked. If you want to ask your question verbally, the host will enable your microphone and ask you to unmute yourself uh, once you've raised your hand. So please be ready to unmute yourself. And feel free to ask your questions in either English or Bahasa. So I'll start with the questions that we've already received. Uh, the first two come from Riho Aizawa. She is a policy research fellow at the Reischauer Center at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And I believe these questions are for any panelist who would like to respond. The first one is on South China Sea and the second one is on the COVID-19 vaccine. So the first question is, how will Indonesia confront China in the South China Sea? While Indonesia was able to receive vaccines from China, it faced military coercion in the South China Sea. Is the Indonesian government interested in security frameworks such as FOIP, the Free and Open Indo-Pacific, or strengthening security relationships with Japan or the United States. And the second question, so that's about uh, South China Sea and, and whether Indonesia will confront China there. The second question is on the vaccine. Is the Indonesian government still eager to receive vaccines from the US to deal with COVID-19 in Indonesia? Indonesia has received Sinovac vaccines. Are there any implications from the current situation for future relationships between Indonesia and the US? or does the Indonesian government just view China as uh, one of the suppliers and it's open to other suppliers as well. Um, so I might just go in order that we did the original presentations and see if you have comments on, on either of those questions, starting with Dr. Merg. I'll, I'll be very brief because I think my Indonesian colleagues uh, will have much better insights on both of these uh, than I will. Uh, on the question of South China Sea, um, obviously we're, we're coming up through uh, the Brunei chairmanship of ASEAN and there'll be yet another round of discussion 
of South China Sea Code of Conduct uh, that will likely have minimal impact, uh, not very positive outcomes. Um, on the question of vaccine diplomacy, it's, it's becoming quite interesting. Uh, China has rolled out the Sinopharm vaccine. We've, we've already received 600,000 doses here in Cambodia. Uh, unfortunately, it only really works for those between the ages of 18 and 59. Uh, which raises some questions as to, well, when do we get Pfizer? Uh, because uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, helping those uh, in, in the greatest need. At the same time, there's a really interesting political, I mean, political dynamic here of, of vaccine provision outside of one's country. Um, China is, of course, a dictatorship uh, and can send vaccines wherever it wants without fear of domestic political implications. Uh, for countries like the United States or the United Kingdom, uh, liberal democracies, um, sending vaccines overseas before their populations are heavily vaccinated is an enormous political risk uh, for, any, for any democratically elected leader. Uh, it fundamentally means uh, if one person dies of COVID who could have been vaccinated, that's going to be the political ad that's run against you uh, for the next three years. You'll be responsible for every single death that occurs. Um, so authoritarian states such as Russia and China do have an advantage uh, in vaccine diplomacy, uh, precisely because their systems do not have uh, democratic feedback uh, that the liberal democracies have. Uh, at the same time, what we've seen so far is that the Moderna vaccine, uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine, those developed by the Western democracies have proven themselves to be uh, significantly more effective. Um, the ideal is that through the WHO and through the new mechanism that they've established, uh, and particularly with the Biden administration's uh, strong commitment to rebuilding multilateralism and it's already re-entering WHO, uh, we'll see a much more active U.S. approach uh, on this side. Uh, on the other aspects, uh, again, as I noted, I'll, I'll yield to, to the experts uh, as, 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 as someone based in Cambodia, I have less insight on, on the particular Indonesia uh, topics. Thanks very much for that. And next we'll go to Rocky. Um, I, I think I would let uh, Dr. Santi to talk about the South China Sea issue in Indonesia. But when it comes to vaccines, I don't think Indonesia has a clear preference of which ones are to get and which ones are to exclude. Um, at this rate, the government of Indonesia has, a par has, has its priority on actually getting the vaccine um, on actually getting the vaccine jabs to its whole population as fast as possible because of the urgency of Indonesia basically failing to control the pandemic like other countries in the region. So the only hope here is to actually fasten the population. As we see, Indonesia has also contracted deals with AstraZeneca on the Oxford vaccine, um, as opposed to only just the Sinovac vaccine by China. Thank you. Dr. Shanti? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, talking about the relations between the Indonesia, China, and Indonesia, US, we know that uh, the uh, person from the China is the one of the policy, I think is the one policy of the China to make the uh, good power in the ASEAN region. So as we know that the, uh, there's a competition of the power in economics between the major power in ASEAN. So I, I think the, the policy of China to get the, uh, the, to get the economic power in ASEAN. So uh, how we can see the role of the China in the case of South China Sea, and then how the China uh, wanted to get the main role in the uh, vaccine in the uh, Indonesia is especially. So, I think we know that uh, in the economic uh, Indonesia economic region, recent years, we know that uh, Indonesia get the uh, strong relationship with China, not only in the health sector, but in the economy sector, uh, especially in infrastructure and in manufacture. So I think it is the, it is the, uh, the uh, Way, the way uh, the policy of the China to be in the uh, main power, main 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 uh, main actor in the economic uh, economic uh, in the uh, Southeast Asia region, and uh, China now that uh, Indonesia is the biggest population, as the and Indonesia uh, has the uh, um, important role in the ASEAN. So uh, how the China uh, uh, relate the, to Indonesia to be in the good actor in economic. So uh, about the uh, relation with US, uh, I think uh, the relation with US uh, will be good in the future because we know that uh, 
economic uh, the partnership between Indonesia and US uh, must uh, uh, already done and now implementation of the partnership so the cooperation with uh, US uh, can be expand in the economic sector and the uh, economic cooperation not only in the health sector we know that Indonesia need uh, many many cooperation in the economic sector especially in capacity building and then the technical cooperation and we know US already get many more in the technical cooperation and capacity capacity building in Indonesia. So I think the relationship between Indonesia, China and Indonesia, US is keeping on the government of Indonesia to manage to maintain the relationship. But uh, I think Indonesia must know that uh, every country has the national interest in here. I, uh, every country has the uh, economic interest in here. So I think Indonesia must uh, uh, how to face the economic interest with uh, the external partners. Okay, thank you. Do you have any, Dr. Shanti, do you have any comments on the Indonesia-Japan relationship? Nah, upon the Indonesia-Japan relationship is very, very interesting for me because uh, my main research is about the Indonesia-Japan relationship. Uh, we know that uh, Indonesia-Japan uh, had the agreement about economic partnership agreement, but we know that Indonesia uh, didn't get optimally uh, beneficial from that, especially in the capacity building. Because uh, the we know the capacity building, I think, is the, uh, the main point in the economic cooperation, because we know the the position between the Indonesia and Japan um, in economic perspective is very, very uh, different because we, we know that uh, Japan is uh, very, very uh, value, has value added uh, industrial production and Indonesia uh, different from that. So I think uh, in here that uh, Africa government, not only Indonesia, must always uh, monitoring always uh, evaluate and monitor every agreement that already agreed, already done. So for the implementation, we can see what, uh, which one point that we don't get the beneficial from that. Okay. Thank you. So the next question I think is for Mr. Rocky and Dr. Shanti. There was news that currently Indonesia is prioritizing trade negotiations with the EU, uh, the I. EUCEPA, a lot of acronyms, regarding the Green Deal rather than expanding to a new interregional economic cooperation in the Pacific. So, what's your take on this? Also, to add that last year, Indonesia signed the INA LAC and is currently focusing on the Indonesia Mozambique partnership. Do you still think that C? PTPP is vital with Indonesia liberalizing its economy on the other side of the world and what pressing matters might be included with that. So I'll let Rocky go first. Wow, another acronym. Um, IEU, CEPA, INA, LAC, so many acronyms, so much for. If the US does come back to CPTPP, please just change it to TPP, lose the CP. Please, but anyway, uh, when it comes to the Indonesia EU trade part negotiations, um, I remember Tom Lombok at the time, Minister of Trade, mentioning that uh, this uh, Indonesia EU trade part is supposedly the springboard of the training ground, uh, so to speak, for Indonesia to conduct a high level, high commitment uh, trade agreement with a, with, a, with a developed country bloc. And also, uh, as well, when it comes to CPTPP, comparing TPP and uh, EUCEPA, Indonesia probably, the calculation for Jakarta probably is that uh, Indonesia already has a trade agreement with countries in Asia Pacific, but it has no such, uh, such thing with countries in Europe, in the European single market. So advocating that compared to TPP in which it already has RCEP anyway, is a, is a, a logical move. And second of all, um, I also remember uh, people like our colleagues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Trade mentioning that uh, at the time there was urgency to actually push for the deal because um, of the EU's green directive. I'm not sure if I uh, mentioned it correctly in the term. There was a green directive by the European Commission to ban palm oil. Um, 
you know, licensing of palm oil was considered unsustainable, stuff like that. There was a concern that um, European green agenda uh, could be hijacked by European protectionist agenda uh, to protect its own rape seed oil industry compared to the imports of Indonesian palm oil. So there were concerns about that. And um, I think a lot of negotiators thought that that was the way to go to actually lock in reforms and provide a framework for the EU and Indonesia to cooperate and resolve the issue. And secondly, I think the calculation for joining CPTPP would be similar to joining TPP if the US is in there. I remember the loudest voices at the time um, advocating for joining TPP were um, textile exporters um, because basically they were afraid that they would lose market share uh, in the US if uh, Vietnam and Malaysia are inside TPP but not Indonesia. I think this urgency would be greater if Philippines and Thailand are inside TPP with the US inside TPP, CPTPP um, anyway. But I think this calculation will still remain the same. Uh, the urgency is less now because the US is not part of uh, TPP, CPTPP anyway. Um, and Indonesia has, for example, an FTA with Japan uh, through RCEP and the Indonesia-Japan Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, and being mindful of Japan being the biggest market right now inside CPTPP anyway. So there isn't, I don't see there is much urgency for Indonesia right now at this current stage with this current form to join CPTPP. But with more members joining in, um, fellow ASEAN members, even the UK, and of course, if the US does uh, return to CPTPP, this calculation definitely will change. Thank you. Dr. Shanti? Thank you. Yeah, uh, talking about CPTPP and other uh, free trade agreement, other free trade agreements. So maybe Indonesia must uh, consider the uh, the first is about the lib uh, liberalization. Because when we talk about the liberalization, so we will we will see about the market access. So when we talk about market access, so Indonesia must uh, consider about the potential market and then potential commodity that we can expand to that market. Because uh, I think the calculation, calculation about that is very, very important because uh, we know that uh, uh, in the case of the uh, IJPA, Indonesia-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement, when does uh, Indonesia uh, didn't calculate uh, calculate optimal from the their potential product. So the the sums of commodity, some as commodity, uh, didn't get the uh, optimally uh, beneficial from the the agreement. But uh, I think uh, to join the CPTPP, Indonesia must yeah the first is con consider and uh, calculation of what kind of the commodity, what kind of the product when we talk about the market liberalization because we seen that uh, the market access is very important for the uh, private sector and we know that uh, we hope that uh, by CPTPP if Indonesia if it join maybe uh, not only in the market access too but Indonesia need to fund the uh, capacity building and then the econ other co economic cooperation that uh, need by Indonesia to uh, endorse uh, to encourage the economic growth in Indonesia because we know that uh, as uh, as I see from the some the agreement that already uh, conclude between Indonesia and external parties uh, I, I ever talk about uh, with the uh, private sector in Indonesia to see about that agreement uh, some of that uh, agree with that uh, the agreement but some of them uh, said that they didn't it important to the formation of the agreement uh, and they 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 think that uh, my uh, my interest in the uh, economic sector is uh, is doesn't appear in the in that agreement. So is it uh, it's different from the Japan uh, Japan uh, agreement when we know that when Japan will uh, join the agreement, he uh, Japan always calculations very very optimal and they uh, Japan know that what product can be ex uh, can expand in that. Uh, Market and then uh, can win in the uh, agreement, but uh, we know that the agreement we, we don't talk about the win and lose, but we talk about the collaboration, cooperation, and win-win solution. But the fact, but we know that uh, Indonesia, especially on the other countries, sometimes uh, 
didn't get the beneficial optimally in this agreement. So I think when uh, if Indonesia will join with in CPTPP, so Indonesia must uh, calculation more about the uh, potential market, about the economic interest. So I think it's very important because I think we must get the uh, beneficial from the every agreement that already concluded with Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now we have a live question from Rob Bjork, who's Director of Regional Affairs at Pacific Forum. Uh, Rob, you should be able to talk. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Thanks for that. Uh, this is primarily for Brad, since he talked a lot about the US and what it's likely to do in terms of regional trade. And <clears throat> the present administration in the US is facing a lot of I shall I say pressure to <clears throat> kind of abandon its predecessor's approach to regional trade and get more involved in the region, but also to promote shared values. And I think I'll, that's a lot of what the quad is about. And I'm wondering, especially given recent events in the region, if you see a tension between promoting trade and promoting shared values, namely democracy, and how you anticipate the administration addressing that tension. Go ahead. Thanks, Rob. It's a, it's, a, it's a great question and a very, very challenging one. Uh, I think one thing that we, we do obviously see the, the beginnings of the Biden administration shifting towards back to uh, uh, the period of multilateralism uh, and the beginnings of discussions of, of trade. Uh, yet it, uh, the, the new administration has been quite, quite forthright uh, that human rights will be at the center. Uh, of that. And uh, it's a question that, that here in mainland Southeast Asia, where we've seen much more of a rollback in liberal democracy, um, we look at Cambodia, we look at Thailand, we look at obviously recent events in Myanmar, um, where there is uh, a very strong need for, for a US response. Uh, and these are elements that are to some degree uh, in tension inherently. Um, under the Trump administration, we didn't see uh, as strong of an approach on, on human rights or trade really for, for mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, one of the questions we have is, is here in Cambodia, uh, we lost uh, EBA access, the everything but arms agreement, uh, trade access to the European Union last year, uh, as the European Union evaluated Cambodia's progress on democracy was, was, was insufficient. Uh, they uh, stated there were severe human rights questions. Um, so Europe's confronted this issue and has, has sort of led the way really, um, saying that, that there are certain priorities uh, and that human rights will, will be one. Um, and a similar approach they took to Myanmar. I think there is something of an expectation that uh, uh, for certain states, the human rights questions will be prioritized. I think the, big, the biggest concern is, is trying to develop a consistent model, uh, a consistent way of prioritizing human rights uh, while also uh, building up trade relations uh, that aren't seen as, or that rather isn't seen as uh, punishing uh, smaller countries, punishing those states that do have uh, relatively small economic relationships with the United States and ensuring that those are consistent. Uh, we saw with the EU a uh, significant blowback uh, here in Cambodia and in other places as Cambodia went, as, as China was, was talking about the vast importance of human rights uh, and, 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 and saying, oh, well, how can Cambodia and Myanmar uh, be doing these things, uh, referring to the Rohingya issue in Myanmar, uh, and then uh, sanctioning them while going ahead and signing free trade agreements with uh, China and with Vietnam, uh, both of which are clearly inconsistent with the values uh, supported by uh, the EU as well as by the other liberal democracies. Uh, so it's going to be a very delicate balancing act as things, as things move forward. Uh, but it's, uh, and it's one that I think we're going to have to wait very carefully and see over the next six months, next six months, uh, where, uh, where US policy goes. Uh, and, uh, but it's not going to be an easy line to tread uh, by any means. Thank you. Now we have a live question from Mark Manantan, who is a resident Basie fellow with Pacific Forum. Mark? Thanks, Crystal. Uh, Great presentation uh, to all. Uh, CP TPP is lauded for its high level provisions and in protecting intellectual property, ensuring environmental and labor standards and curbing the influence of state owned enterprises 
while um, RCEP lack, uh, lacks these qualities. Uh, Rocky and Professor Shanti, you both mentioned that RCEP will continue to be reviewed and evolve over time. So my first question is, what are the prospects for RCEP to integrate some of the standards from the CPTPP? And my second que question relatedly is, the lack of high-level standard provisions for RCEP signifies ASEAN's accommodation of China's sensitive political proclivities, especially we all know about the issue of intellectual property and uh, state-owned enterprises. If so, what does, it, uh, what does this mean for ASEAN's uh, convening power? Thanks very much. We'll go Rocky first and then Shanti, if that works. Rocky? Mm, I... Um... I, I would not um, pretend to be able to predict the future, um, but looking at the past record of RCEP, I wouldn't be that pessimistic, to be honest, of RCEP's prospects of integrating some standards from CPTPP. For example, uh, the uh, digital, digital trade and uh, intellectual property chapters in RCEP were surprisingly quite advance as uh, compared to what we expected, especially compared to the standards in WTO, especially since we, if we remember, our CEP was expect, expected to focus mainly on market access, uh, lowering tariffs, rules of origin, stuff like that. Um, so I'm not an optimistic, I'm not a pessimistic on that front. On the second uh, part of the question, um, I wouldn't say that this makes us as convening power lesser or that this actually means ASEAN was overly accommodating of China's sensitive political interests, more on the sense that ASEAN member states were accommodating to its own political sensitivities. Um, the, 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 the tendencies to uh, flout intellectual property protections and to uh, provide protections for uh, enterprises are not an, a monopoly uh, by China. Um, the Berhats um, in, in Malaysia, uh, all those government linked corporations in Singapore, and so many BUMN um, or SOEs in Indonesia um, play a prominent role in our various economies. Um, I think in Indonesia, if I remember the numbers correctly, um, the combined value of uh, BUMN or SOEs in Indonesia is around 30% of our GDP, which is a lot. Um, Indonesia uses um, uses um, RGD, for example, Indonesia uses uh, our BOM and our SOEs to push for economic development, especially under President Jokowi. Um, for example, as we see, we have so many, uh, in, in Jokowi's first term, there were so many uh, capital injections to SOEs to build new infrastructure. Um, I don't see that changing um, in the near future if Jokowi has the means to do that. I'm not sure that this actually makes Jokowi less inclined to join CPTPP, but it will definitely factor into the calculation. Thank you, Dr. Shanti. Okay, thank you. Uh, when we talk about the RCEP, we know that uh, RCEP is the first free trade agreement that covering uh, China, Japan, and South Korea. And I think it is uh, unlike the CPTPP, that RCEP uh, include uh, not include a prov uh, provision to harmonize the regulatory standards on the environments and labor market. So, uh, uh, as uh, the Mr. Rocky said, that the RCEP is uh, focused on the uh, free trade and how to the lower lowering the tariff. So, uh, so what different of the two kind of this? Uh, we know that the uh, ASEAN countries uh, that have joined with CPTPP maybe can expect expect the expect the additional opportunities from the CPTPP. We know that, for example, uh, like uh, Brunei Darussalam, maybe uh, can diversify the its economy and expand uh, expand the market not only in oil and gas, and then uh, also like uh, Malaysia also. Uh, Again, again the, from the expansion of the market uh, of the positive impact uh, on the employment. So uh, I think when we talk about the RCEP and CPTP, it's also uh, as uh, said that uh, we know that uh, the China in RCEP maybe will 
we get the uh, beneficial match cost. We know that now PUMN of China uh, expand expand uh, their production and then their uh, market uh, in ASEAN countries. But we can see that uh, Indonesia BUMN too uh, already uh, expanded uh, the market and expanded the cooperation between uh, BUMN in ASEAN region. So we hope that uh, the phenomenon of the uh, BUMN expansion in the uh, economy globally will can give the opportunity for the BUMN from the South members uh, ASEAN countries for uh, expand more and more in the region, not only in the ASEAN but uh, outside the ASEAN. And we hope that the ASEAN cooperation and ASEAN collaboration uh, can make the BUMN from the ASEAN countries more stronger and more more uh, uh, have the capabilities to uh, make the good market in outside ASEAN, not only in the ASEAN region. Because we know now, uh, uh, even though in the RCEP we we can we can describe that the BUMN from the ASEAN countries will will, will compete with the uh, BUMN from China. And that we know that recently in the BUMN from China. Uh, expanding market and expand the production in the Southeast region. So I think the cooperation and collaboration uh, between the UMN in the uh, Southeast Asia region is uh, needed because, because as I said that uh, uh, how we can get the opportunity of the RCEP in that not only China but ASEAN must get the opportunity to get the market to get the uh, position in capability in the uh, RCEP. So I think uh, the ASEAN countries must, uh, as I said, that always monitor and always uh, uh, monitor of the implementation implementation of uh, RCEP after the ratification. So, so it uh, I think it's it can be done with the ASEAN countries. Thank you, and um, Dr. Merg, do you want to weigh in? Sure. Uh, just on, on just to be very quick on the question of, of RCEP uh, moving forward with CPTPP uh, standards. I'm I'm quite quite pessimistic. Um, Beijing is clear that its model is based on state-owned enterprises and subsidies to those. Um, expanding RCEP to 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 weaken its 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 the essence of its economy is is I think is simply a no-go for China. Uh, as China finds continuing challenges with access to American technology, uh, we'll see, uh, I don't think we're gonna see any change on intellectual property either. Beijing is going to continue to prioritize its own sectors. It's more likely that China will use RCEP as a way to expand bilateral free trade agreements, uh, acting in its own interest, much easier to negotiate for, uh, with China one-on-one -on -one than doing anything as, as, as a group. Uh, so I, I don't think our, I don't see RCEP as moving as, as moving forward on those much needed environmental labor, intellectual property, and SOE standards. Um, the second part of the question, on the question of ASEAN competition, um, there are going to be differences. Countries like Malaysia and Vietnam are particularly well placed uh, to do very well out of RCEP. Um, others are going to experience uh, bigger challenges. Uh, Again, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar being the most uh, most uh, apparent. Um, I think the biggest concern as we move forward into the into the question of uh, industrial revolution 4.0 and the question of the growth of a digital economy is China has a huge head start, and China has an enormous digital footprint already in Southeast Asia. Uh, and the question really becomes how will Southeast Asian states be able to respond and actively compete uh, with China? on digitalization as it moves forward. Um, this is a huge advantage for China as it's increasingly locked out of other markets for its technology. Uh, and this is something that Southeast Asian nations are going to have to very seriously uh, consider as they develop their own tech industries, um, just simply looking at how far ahead Beijing is. So there are uh, serious questions. I think the question is absolutely, absolutely well put uh, in terms of competitiveness for ASEAN in the context of RCEP. Thanks very much for those comments. And actually, we're just, just out of time for today's event. I, we have plenty more I'm sure we could discuss, but hopefully we can keep the discussion going. So thank you so much for our esteemed panelists and participants for joining us today. We do hope you'll continue staying engaged with Pacific Forum programming, which you can find out more about on our website, www.pacforum.org, O-R-G. The second session of this series will be in late March on cybersecurity, 
It will focus on how the US and Indonesia can strengthen their collaboration in combating emerging cyber threats and vulnerabilities in light of rapid technological advancement and the aftermath of COVID-19. The webinar will also review existing technical capacity building and confidence building mechanisms that provoke, promote cyber norms and the application of international law in the cyber domain. Please stay tuned for more details on the next session. I'd also like to remind you of the post event survey, which we'll share again in the chat box now. We would really appreciate if you would take a few minutes to complete it and share with us your feedback. It's completely anonymous, uh, particularly as this is the first in a series of nine sessions and we want to make them as engaging and productive for all of you as possible. So thank you again to our speakers for joining us today, to our partners CSIS and UPN Veteran Jakarta and to the US Embassy Jakarta, of course, for making this event series possible. We hope that we'll see you at the next event in our series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you, Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Crystal. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Crystal. Thank, thank you. Dr. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.